will upload and record those questions. So you can find them if you're looking towards that. So thanks for joining for our last of the Get Growing webinar series. Today we're going to feature successful squash. I hope you've gotten a lot out of these last couple of weeks with different topics. And I know I've gotten quite a bit of, of feedback and lots of great emails from people who have been asking questions related to production. So it's really been a great tool for us and I've really enjoyed this experience. And I'll share with you at the end that we are looking to do additional webinars of this. The successful squash and kind of that big squash family is one of the main um, crops that we think about when it comes to summer vegetables. And I felt like it was one to really zero in and focus on, especially as for a lot of us, we're probably a month away from planting of these. We have time to then decide on the right cultivars, think about the spacing, and also consider how we're gonna grow this crop family because it's just not in the ground just yet. I also find when it comes to some of the work that I do, as well as the interactions I have with master gardeners who manage our, our hotline, we get a lot of questions about this family and related to insects, disease, and sometimes just general practices. And what I've tried to do today is to hit on some of the main points when it comes to growing them, uh, which we'll talk about as we go along today. But if we're, you're very familiar or unfamiliar, this is a very large family. So we're not just gonna spend an hour and a half on zucchini or summer squash. We're gonna talk about a lot of other family members today, many of which you see in this photo here. Yet again, um, I'm Grant McCarty, I'm a local foods and small farms educator, and I cover Stevenson, um, Joe Davis, and Winnebago counties. So I'm up in Northern Illinois. Uh, all three of my counties touch the Wisconsin state line. I know that there are a number of folks joining us from other parts of the state, and so I just want to give you a little bit of a geographical familiarity with where we are at. If you joined us last week on our call for tomatoes and peppers, I shared with you that I was dealing with snow as of that morning, and I'm happy to say that the snow has dissipated, uh, at least for the time being, we hope. My programming area tends to be in soil and soil management. I focus a lot on commercial and non-commercial fruits and vegetables, which is backyard growers, community gardens, any of those kind of groups that are working in fruits and vegetables. I do a lot of work in insect and disease management from the diagnosis to coming up with plans when it comes to controlling them. And for the last four years, I've been working in fruit tree pruning production and focusing in that area. As shared with you previously, I am in planting zone 5B. My territory is that planting zone 5. And what happens is that the last spring frost is around mid-May. And that may dictate really what some of the information I share with you uh, today. You may find that you, depending on where you're located in the state, are maybe a week or two away from planting this squash family. With reality, though, in northern Illinois, we're looking towards the end of May when it comes to planting this. Today's plan is going to be in the cultivar selection. I'll discuss seed starting and transplanting, why you might do one versus the other. This might be a topic that you might be thinking of doing this year. For instance, if you have always started your seeds in the garden and you find maybe poor success with it when it comes to the squash family, Maybe this year you might decide to actually do some transplanting and start your transplants indoors. I'll zero in and focus on seasonal management. This is an area where you can sometimes set your squash family up for success that season, or it could be an issue where you maybe run into some trouble with it. I wanna mention a couple of different tips and tricks in that section then. What I've tried to do is to introduce these family members based on their kind of grouping. In the next slide, we'll go into more detail a little bit about that. Because I think with each of these family members, such as the cucumbers or our winter squash, they have similarities, and yet they may have some differences when it comes to actually growing them. And you want to think a little bit more about that. We'll get into insects and disease management. I've tried to really focus in on that for the last part of today. And then finally, mention harvest. There's a number of the squash that are pretty easy to know when to pick and when to harvest. Yet there are some that are a little bit trickier when it comes to actually determining when to pick and how to pick. I think about watermelon as a 
prime example of when to pick and have had both successful years of harvesting my watermelon at the right time. I've also had very poor years where I have unsuccessfully harvested that watermelon via too early or, or really too late some cases. That's why we talk about the harvest then. You see a Jaradel pumpkin here in this photo. I love Jaradel pumpkin and I have it spelled out in another slide coming up, but it's one of my favorite ones that doesn't always get enough attention. The squash family has more of a proper name, which is that cucurbit family. And this is a very large family. We're talking sometimes close to 965 species. And there's a number of resources out there when it comes to finding out new cultivars and varieties to grow, where you could be growing sometimes very different family members every single year. It can be very overwhelming sometimes is what I find when it comes to it. And yet, it is that space that really will dictate how much you can grow or how little you can sometimes grow. All of them tend to have a vining plant characteristic. You know, we think about just the way that they grow and the way they overtake the garden sometimes. We really see them kind of spread out. And that's very true for most of these family members is having that characteristic with them. You will find bush types, which we will talk about today, and yet we'll still have a little bit of that vining quality, if you will. Most of them will have a yellow, orange, or a white flower. And these flowers may be very big and broad, or they could be very, very small and minuscule. It can vary considerably, and yet they will have that. You will find a wide range of different shapes, sizes, textures, and uses. If you want to grow watermelon, you will find sometimes a four to five pound watermelon. If you want to grow the biggest pumpkin that you can get, like an Atlantic giant that gets 900 pounds if, if everything goes as planned, you will also find that, as well as finding even those smaller baby pumpkins and baby cores. So very wide range of different uses and shapes and, and textures, as well as just what you may be determining what your end use may be and what your family wants to do with that. They really thrive in the summer heat. And I think if you have had sometimes poor success when it comes to growing them, you may find a later planting may be what you're after. It could be that you're growing in an area that's just staying a little bit cooler than it should be for these plants to really take off. And I'll talk with you more about that as we go along today. As always, these have similar diseases. They also have very similar insects. While some insects like certain ones more than others, they tend to have similar ones. So when it comes to controlling an insect or disease on your zucchini, you may also want to think about the impact of that on your pumpkins, your watermelon, your muskmelons as well too. You see a photo of a wide range of different colors, textures, and shapes here. Uh, we even think about this very small patty pan zucchini squash that might be the size of your fist. And yet in this photo, you can see that kind of patty pan shape is actually found in some of our winter squash as well. Oops. Sorry, I am seeing something on my screen. Hold on one second. What is going on there? Sorry about that. There's a line across my screen for some reason. Okay. Hold on, hold on. This is weird. Give me one second, guys. Sorry about this. I don't know where this is coming from. <laughs> Do you all see it as well? Clear annotations, disable participant annotations. Okay, thank you. Clear all drawings. Okay, all right. Sorry about that, and thank you for the troubleshooting in the chat box, Bruce. Let's see. Okay. All right. So back to it then. You're going to find that um, a number of these can be kind of uh, different categories, and we're going to talk about these categories as we go along today. That winter squash, the summer squash, cucumbers, watermelon, pumpkin gourds, as well as melons, and kind of talk about these kind of broad, broad categories to 
that you really see here and get into more detail as to what each of these is encountering and what you're really dealing with with here. So thinking about these cultivars then, I think one of the main decisions you're gonna to have to make is based on its physical features. Is it gonna be that bush type that could be pretty compact and be able to kind of grow in a certain area? Or could it have that vining type characteristic that could really spread out and be over your garden? And this is something where, yes, you could do some trellising, you could provide some support, you could really help some of these varieties and cultivars be very limited in how far they can spread kind of based on their features. But this is something I think you're gonna to have to really think quite a lot about is those physical features with it. And a lot of times a seed catalog, a seed packet, as well as transplants will list some of this information to really guide you with it. And while some of it can be very true that in row spacing for some should be six to seven feet or maybe eight feet, you may also find guidance between rows. And I would be very cautious to, to really follow, follow that clearly. Yet again, spacing is gonna be a major crux of this and a major decision you're gonna to have to really make when it comes to the limitations or perhaps the, the area that you have with growing that. I would also consider flavor a major piece here, and it may take you trying out a new cultivar or variety to actually determine whether or not you like that one um, compared to just kind of reading information about it online or from what others have shared with you. And sometimes the flavor can be um, certainly uh, something that you do see um, with, with some of these features is that the flavor can be pretty, pretty strong compared to some of the environmental features with it. Um, uses, whether this is gonna be something that you're going to cook with, it's gonna be eaten raw, it's gonna be you know, maybe even preserved, might be a, something that you have to look at in the situation too. In Northern Illinois, I think it's very crucial to consider the maturity dates thinking that some of these are going to take sometimes over a hundred days to actually yield and to be harvested can take some time, especially as we think of planting these towards the end of May and harvesting these, you know, sometimes towards the end of August. You may run into some issues there where a very long period of growing them um, may be an issue because it just takes some time for some of these varieties and cultivars to really grow. Recognize that there are a number of cultivars that will list greenhouse, and these should be grown in the greenhouse. Do not try to adapt them to an outside growing area because they are just not going to perform well for you. You're going to potentially run into some issues when it comes to their performance. So anything that has that greenhouse, avoid. Usually we see that sometimes with a greenhouse cucumber, for instance, they're just not going to do well for you. One other thing to look at would be disease resistance. You will find a number of cultivars that have some form of disease resistance, and this can be very helpful if you have had issues of downy, powdery mildew, fissarium wilt, much more so in your previous years. Um, that would be something to kind of, kind of look at uh, with this situation. Um, this includes a lot of more cucumbers that tend to be a bit more commonly found with some resistance. And I always still encourage folks to look at having a mixture of susceptible as well as resistant ones. Some of the major diseases you'll see is powdering down in mildew, and you will note a DM or a PM will be listed there. Fissarium wilt can also be a problem with, with some of these. Um, I've included a number of examples of ones that have resistance, but as always, there's, there's always newer ones on the market when it comes to kind of growing these. Market More 76, a very common cucumber that has resistance. You may see revenue, zucchini as one as well. In thinking more about these cultivars, like I've shared with you, consider your space, consider the end use. I think those are going to be the two major things to really consider at this time. Talk a lot with others as we still have a number of weeks to go when it comes to planting these towards the end of May. 
you have some time to actually, you know, find out what people like and what people are growing. Um, and as I shared with you last week, I always ask, you know, what did you not like? I think that is very true. And I can give myself as an example. I grew a sugar baby type of watermelon a couple years ago in our Rockford Extension office. And while it's a great performer, it yields great, the, the color on the outside is good and the flavor is good, it's full of seeds. I felt like I was just eating seeds from this sugar baby variety. And it was one that while I'm used to seeded watermelon, I was not used to that many seeds in my watermelon. And it is one that I would probably not grow in the future. I know others that have had good success with it and like I share with you, it grows really well. And yet I just did not like that there were so many seeds in this watermelon. There's a number of new cultivars every year from the All America Selection winners. I know this year is Mambo F1. It's a watermelon that has a really good performance and really good flavor to it. I have tried to include a number of recommendations from that Seed Kitchen Collaborative from the University of Wisconsin throughout today's presentation. So you will see that on slides as, as we go along today. Um, you will find seed catalogs, home and garden centers will have a number of different cultivars too. Please note that a lot of them are starting to be sold out. I've encountered that as I've started to look towards cultivars to add to my backyard garden area this year. Um, one of the websites that I do use is pickacarrot.com, which is a bit of like a seed search engine, if you will. If you have an idea for what cultivar you want to grow that season, you can put the cultivar name in there and it can find you a number of websites from seed companies where you could order the seeds. It is not always the most accurate and it does take some troubleshooting when it comes to finding out and finding where these cultivars are to purchase. However, it is a place that I've started using more and more as we're seeing many seed catalogs and seed companies um, sold out of different cultivars and varieties. One of the main questions that we get when it comes to the squash family is whether to start the plants indoors or to start the plants, say, in the garden, do direct seeding of them. Because they have such big seeds, they can really thrive fine in the soil. And then there are some folks that will always start these seeds indoors, at least for three or four weeks, and then transplant into the garden pretty well and pretty successfully. So it's really up to you. Um, I think that's really what we see is that if you were to order seeds right now or pick up seeds and you wanted to start these indoors for yourself, you would have three to four weeks of a good start to be able to then put them into the garden. Um, usually you don't see more than a month when it comes to them. Um, you know, if you shock them, that's a couple days before planting. So in this situation, you are growing your seeds indoors, you're getting closer to transplant into the garden and leading up to it, you actually want to take them out to your growing area for a couple hours every evening. And it will just get these plants ready to go and get them adjusted to what those evening temperatures can be. So they're just not immediately shocked, if you will, when you actually start to transplant them. The other side would be direct seeding. You would do this about one to two weeks after last frost. So probably towards the end of May really is what you would see in this situation. You would also typically plant a number of seeds in that area, so more than Kind of three seeds in a certain area and then thin to one of them after at least 10 days if not longer within that situation. This would work fine for you and, and people will have good success doing this direct seeded route. Um, typically though add about 10 days to that maturity date. So if it is a cucumber or a squash plant that you expect to yield at say 75 or 80 days, add an additional 10 days to that situation. We don't tend to see much difference between either option. I think it really comes down to what your situation is. Folks have said starting seeds indoors, sometimes they have very fragile root systems when it comes to planting in the garden. Uh, others have had very good success doing it that way and not had any issues. The main thing that you might run into would be your soil temperature. 
And the soil temperature for this family to germinate needs to be between 65 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You may find that as you start to go out and actually plant into the soil, that your temperatures may just not be where they need to be as far as the soil temperatures go. And there's a number of guides online that, that try to do records and keep records of what soil temperatures in the area tends to be. Um, but usually based on our calendar date, towards the end of May is pretty comfortable to plant them. But as I share with you, the soil temperatures could, could be the issue. One of the things that you could do to address this would be a hilling process. You would plant your direct seeds into the soil, and then you would kind of raise that soil up, kind of create kind of a hilling kind of bed with it. It isn't necessarily the same thing as hilling up potatoes. This is kind of raising up the soil. Sometimes this is a, a, a width of six to eight inches down your row, that hilling up process. And it would allow you to raise the soil up, which could help the soil become warmer. And this could be something to kind of get you over the issue when it comes to poor germination that you might be encountering with your with your vegetables and with this squash family. Uh, you're creating that small area, you're planting the seeds, and then you're thinning out those weaker ones. Um, commonly you see this with watermelons, you see with pumpkins, gourds, and melons. You may also decide to do this with cucumbers and squash even too. This could be an option if you're kind of thinking that you need to get the soil temperatures just a little bit warmer. This method could also be combined with a plastic mulch to actually heat and warm that soil up much more than without it, and maybe could help you um, when it comes to getting good germination and getting your plants started off. This might be something where if you've struggled to have germination with that direct seeded route, you might decide to go this route. So some general planting then. Typically we see the end of May as I share with you. Um, that's what we see in Northern Illinois that weekend right before Mold Day weekend. As you think of planting peppers and tomatoes the end of May that weekend before Memorial Day weekend, this might be the same time that you actually direct seed some of your squash family members in the soil there too. Central Illinois about May 15-ish <laughs> is, is a pretty good estimate. For Southern Illinois, May 5th-ish is, is a pretty good one for them too. They are usually two weeks ahead of us when it comes to planting squash family members um, based on dates. But I know it can vary sometimes from geographic area to geographic area. You're after good drainage for this family too. This family is not one where if you have poor drainage in your garden or growing area that you would then plant. They're not gonna perform well for you when it comes to growing and yielding for you. You really want to ensure they have good drainage, which could be that you're adding compost or you're adding some kind of amendment to help the, uh, the transplants get started. You're also after a pH of a six to 7.2. Uh, typically we see this for most vegetable gardens uh, throughout the growing area. They do well with that, that pH zone. You might also consider just a general fertilizer with 10, 10, 10. Know that there are some types of squash family members that may benefit from more nitrogen compared to phosphorus or potassium. It may depend on what you are growing. I think more about some of those very large pumpkin, pumpkin family members that really need a lot of nitrogen as the growing season gets going. And you may find that you need to supplement and play around with that just slightly. As always, look to follow that spacing requirement. Having good airflow, the ability for the vines to spread out, and the ability for them to dry out, you know, especially as we get more rain, is very crucial when it comes to their good yields, as well as for addressing some of those disease problems that we see a lot of issues with and really run into. Some more general management when it comes to this family. Try to have the area as weed free as much as you can. I think that's true for a lot of our vegetable gardens is to really start out strong when it comes to weed management to ensure that weeds do not become too much of a problem as we get later on into our growing season. We're also aiming for very good airflow and that's what it's very good to have uh, the spacing needs met so that the 
plant material can dry out and keep disease from being a problem and allow for it to have a very successful season. You might consider mulching around your plants. I'm a bit hesitant when it comes to some of it because the issue you run into can be that this can be a great place for insects to hide. I think it's very different if you were to say, um, start to put mulch underneath the vines as they spread out uh, with a straw mulch or you know, some other mulching system that you may have availability to but still be a little cautious of getting too much out there because you may create a habitat for these wonderful insect pests to increase in population and move in. I know a number of folks that have had good success with mulching around the squash family members though, just be a little cautious when it comes to this. We're aiming for about one, one and a half inch of rainwater per week or water per week for this family to thrive. I typically recommend a rain gauge just to be able to see how much that I'm getting in that week and then be able to kind of play around with how much I might need to add. One of the questions I've gotten about in the last week or two has been about trellising and we'll talk more about that today because you may find this is the year to trellis the squash family members. You see a photo of this in a raised bed situation where they are trellising on the edge of their growing area, including some tomatoes and peppers I recognize, uh, but this is allowing for them to get some of the vines and the fruit off the ground. They also are growing them in a square foot garden situation too, which I think can be quite helpful when it comes to thinking about your footprint and your growing area. What about getting the fruit off the ground? I look through a number of garden catalogs Sometimes I will see these plastic discs that can be staked into the ground. And as my squash family is growing, you can actually nest or rest the squash on them. This is something like melon or watermelon or even pumpkin that could be, you know, sat on these discs and it's off the ground, it's not touching the soil. That could be an option. It kind of depends on your growing situation and really what you're after here with it. You could probably also get away with putting some cardboard underneath that um, squash or others that you're wanting to make sure that it stays pretty pristine. So it depends quite often on your situation. Beyond growing in the soil or in a raised bed, there's certainly other ways to grow. And this includes a lot of containers. You will find a bush type a number of cultivars that will have that bush type quality that can do really well in containers. And it's kind of choosing the right containers and ensuring that you have some form of drainage that can kind of set you up, set you apart. You might also decide that if you are growing into that container and maybe it has more of that vining characteristic, that this may be combined with a trellising situation and providing support for your, um, your container and the vegetable you're growing. I've experimented with some of our container gardening in that five gallon bucket, which you see in this photo. Uh, this was one of the ones where it wasn't necessarily for containers, but I thought that I might try to see if I could experiment with it, where the vines would just kind of be growing on the other sides over the, the bucket, the container itself. And it did okay, it wasn't as successful as I was thinking it was going to be. And yet again, I think some of my issues were more tied to drainage than anything. But I think you can find some really neat experimentation when it comes to growing these in containers. Because in most cases, you know, the vines are going everywhere, you just have to control them and have some kind of support system for them to really thrive. In. Square foot garden is another option for growing your uh, squash family members. Typically, you know, if we think about those standard square sizes of our squash family or our square foot gardening, we see two seeds of pickling cucumbers per square, one melon and one to squash per kind of square, uh, six by six inch square, but they'll need trellising. That's really what that square foot gardening system is designed for is to have some trellising system in there to get them up and off of that area. Straw bell gardening would also be another option. You could grow squash, cucumbers, and lots of other ones within the straw bells. They would be direct seeded in a mixture of kind of a seed starting mix directly into that straw, the 
straw bell garden situation and probably have some pretty good success with it too. For our general management section, these are just some of the highlights when it comes to actually growing and methods that you may decide to incorporate into your growing situation this season or some practices that maybe you haven't necessarily considered previously. There's a lot of recipes out there that talk about you know, stuffing zucchini blossoms and frying zucchini blossoms and know that we're talking about the male flowers in this situation. So you could be growing zucchini in order to get that beautiful black zucchini and harvest and cook with, but you could also be harvesting some of the male flowers once you have gotten uh, pollination occurring for your crop. It's very crucial to not remove all the flowers because you really are just removing those male flowers if you so choose to harvest and eat them. Uh, male flowers if it appear first on the zucchini plant in June, and then the female flowers will follow up. Once the female flowers have pollinated and you've gotten some small kind of swelling at the base of a female flower, uh, you then have the male flowers left over, which could be removed and you could stuff them. Um, but that's what folks will, will do uh, to eat uh, and stuff with different things in their cooking. Companion planting can also be useful. Nasturium as well as marigold are two that have been recommended through that Iowa State resource that I've previously shared with you. Both of these are used to address, I believe, cucumber beetle in your growing area. I, for the last couple of years, have grown a cover crop of buckwheat. The buckwheat is what you see in this photo, this very nice white flower quality to it. I tend to plant it a week before I will actually plant my squash family members. The benefit here is that it attracts a number of pollinators and it will also bloom earlier than my squash family members. So kind of getting ready for, getting my pollinators in place ready for my next wave of squash family members to uh, start producing. It does go quickly to seed. Just recognize that it takes about 45 days for it to go to seed. So a very quick turnaround and you need to remove it before it starts depositing its seeds in the soil or else it can really thrive and take off in your garden area. One of the main squash family members for trap cropping is called Blue Hubbard squash. And you see a photo of Blue Hubbard here. A lot of our insects in the squash family those insect pests tend to really love blue hubbard squash much more than some of our other squash family members. What you may do in this situation, in the trap cropping situation, is you would plant it as your sacrifice. You would plant it potentially one or two weeks earlier than your other squash members that you want to save. And the idea is that the insect pest will be more heavily interested in the Blue Hubbard squash than they will with the other squash family members. So you're sacrificing one to save the good of the whole. You still may get some Blue Hubbard squash from here and recognize that you still need to manage your insect pests once they are all over the Blue Hubbard squash, but it may help you address some of those insect pest pressures by being the sacrifice. On to trellising then. I think that depending on your situation, you might decide to go down the route of trellising. And yet again, um, it will be aligning with the different cultivars and varieties that you're going to be growing. Many of the vining types may benefit from this situation. You could be easier to harvest. They could provide some very good airflow to help dry out some of those leaves that you see. Um, uh, get hit really hard with some of our disease problems. It may also improve the quality of the squash through both the shape, the color, and just the expectation that you may have for the squash that you're going to grow. I think one of the challenges may be that you need to help the plant get started. So while you may be growing your cucumber plants, you've placed the trellis system in place, you will probably still need to, at least for that one or two weeks, actually help the vines become a bit more attached to that trellising system. They will want to naturally do that, but you may have to help guide them in that situation. I think one of the main benefits would be helping with space saving. I think that's what you would really find is that the space saving can be really nice when it comes to a trellising system. 
And yet again, you're matching these up. You know, you may find that a very heavy pumpkin, squash, watermelon, or melon may not make the most sense when it comes to a trellising system because the expected fruit is really heavy. Uh, a Jaradel pumpkin that can get sometimes 15 to 20 pounds is not necessarily going to be the best fit for a trellising system or would really need a lot more support in that situation. There's a number of options for trellising. You see a lots of kind of plastic nettings that can be tied on either ends of, say, a wooden stake down a row, and that can be an easy thing to do. We have hog panels, which you see in this photo. This was taken a couple of years back, and we were growing gourds on our hog panels. You also see that there is some cucumber mixed in there as well. So it was a nice kind of feature, decorative feature in our growing area. It also kept the squash off of the ground. And in this situation, it worked well. But yet again, the hog pan is a pretty hard, heavy duty type of trellising system. Metal teepees are available. You will also find a lot of just kind of making your own and DIY options. In these photos, you see kind of both those trellising netting systems, very common ones that you will find at home and garden centers. And you see that both of them are kind of tied at the end when it comes to both wooden stakes as well as some heavier metal uh, staking systems here too. I think cucumbers would be one of the main ones that you would see some great benefits to, especially as we know how some of our vining cucumbers can really spread out and this can impact the fruit because occasionally we will forget and cannot find some of our cucumbers. And when you finally find it, you will see that it is just ginormous and it's inedible at that point. Uh, so that might be one to kind of look at in the situation. Zucchini, some of our other summer squash, may also find some benefits here with it. I think the only thing to consider then is that if you were to utilize these, most of them are a kind of plastic netting system where you do have to throw away at the end of the season. I haven't heard too many folks have good success with actually recycling these or using these from season to season, just because the squash can kind of take over um, in that situation. So let's now get into the next part of today's presentation and kind of highlight these kind of family member groups within that. You know, a lot of what I've shared with you as far as general management, as far as cultivar selection, as far as some of those intricate things are pretty true across the board for most of our family member group. Uh, and yet I want to highlight a couple of additional things when it comes to somewhat cultivar selection. So when we think about cucumbers, for instance, you'll see a lot of information out there when it comes to different types. You'll see something like a slicing cucumber, a pickling cucumber, pickling being one that certainly I would be growing with the end result that I'm probably gonna pickle, I'm probably gonna uh, preserve it. You'll also see a lot of things such as the seedless, a thin-skinned, English, burpless. They all tend to be the same thing, which is an edible skin on the outside and typically it's going to be very long, narrow cucumber that may be getting between 10 to 12 inches long, if sometimes not a little bit longer. There's also a number of interest in specialty cucumbers, one of which you see here is the lemon cucumber, a very round, bulbous shape to it with yellow distinctive features. It has a different taste to it, a bit more of a lemon kind of fresher quality to it. Um, I think it's okay. <laughs> I've grown it myself. It, it's fine. Uh, others have really like it though. Yet again, the greenhouse, avoid that greenhouse cucumber. It's not going to perform for you in a outdoor set. You have the slide set today with list a number of different uh, cultivars and varieties. Some of these have been recommended from University of Illinois. A number of these have also been recommended through some of the other resources that we have. So you will find kind of broad categories. You will also see that a bush feature will be commonly in a lot of different names, such as a bush crop, which would tell me it's a very long, green slicing cucumber, a very distinctive one, very similar quality. You may also find a pickling cucumber that has a bush quality to it and would give you the best of both worlds. If your end goal was to preserve and you only had so much space, 
a bush, pickle, cucumber could give you both things that you really need. There's a lot of interest in specialty cucumbers, especially in very small cucumbers. You see the Mexican sour gherkin here. Um, it is maybe as big as your thumb, if not smaller, and just covers the cucumber plant. Green apple, crystal apple are two other ones that individuals have mentioned to me before that are just very unique, kind of different in both their flavor as well as their shape to it. And many of these you may find as transplants, although I think you're going to find a lot more of them available at seed. And so as you think about the route you're going to go when it comes to planting, you're going to find the seeds pretty accessible through online or maybe even locally as well. I've tried to include for each member some spacing information as well as the row spacing that you might consider. But as always, recognize that this can vary a little bit differently. And so in most cases for a cucumber, we're thinking about 12 inches apart in down a single row. Typically, we're seeing about five to six feet between that row. And as shared with you, I think you're gonna find some pretty good benefit with a netting or some sort of trellising system. And trellising could be provided by an old tomato cage as well. You may have to play around with it, and yet you may find some good benefits with it too. This group tends to have a very short maturity date. About 48 to 65 days is commonly what we see. And know that when we talk about a maturity date of 48 to 65 days, we are talking about putting the seed into the ground or that transplant into the ground. Although the transplant would be a couple weeks earlier, actually, in its yield. Harvest is going to vary based on size and use. And yet again, look at that seed packet. You may find that this cucumber is expected to get 8 to 10 inches in length versus another cucumber that maybe is going to be 4 to 6 inches. You will find this information on your seed packets and a lot of transplant information too. The melon category is mostly we're talking about the musk melon. We see a lot of terms sometimes of cantaloupe or musk melon. Know that a cantaloupe is a type of musk melon. So it's just one of them. And yet in the United States, we've used the cantaloupe term kind of to mean kind of everything. And yet on an international scale, a cantaloupe is just a type of musk melon. So we're talking about musk melons. Typically, we see about two to three feet apart in a row. You could see then six feet between rows. There are a number of cultivars that have much smaller fruit, and you will find that the spacing can be even tighter for it because of their uh, smallness and stature. With this group, you may also find some bush types that will be much smaller in their growing area as well. Typically, we see maturity about 65 to 80 days. So yet again, if I was thinking of Northern Illinois, I might think about a cultivar that reaches maturity around 65, 70 days, just knowing full well what some of our season can look like. One of the things that I do wanna highlight is that the fruit number varies based on type. While there are a number of great musk melons to recommend that grow really well for you, you may find that from a single plant, you could be getting just two to three melons. And if that plant is needing a greater growing area, you may find it just is not justified for your needs. So be very careful in looking at that because I do know that a lot of musk melons will not yield as much as we expect, and yet they may be taking up a very large part of our garden. This could also be one where I decide to trellis and just get it off of the ground yet again playing around with how I support it. You'll find good disease resistance for many cultivars. The Gallia melon, which you see here, is more of that green flesh, more of that almost expected honeydew uh, coloration. I've listed a number of other musk melon types out there. Uh, so you will find when you look at a catalog, it could be a, a Nana's melon. And from there, there may be three or four different cultivars in there. This one tends to be more sweet, more aromatic. You see kind of slightly spiciness to it as well. Um, the Asian musk melon tends to be more small, oblong shape. It also has a much more earlier to maturity date compared to some of the other ones that are out there. One of the most popular melons the last couple of years is the butterscotch type. It's much smaller 
it is more round, and it also has superior flavor. I think this is one that you might decide to grow this season if you are looking for something new in the Musk Mountain category. Lots of interest in this type. It comes across as highly rated. And yet again, you will find a butterscotch type, and then you will also find a different cultivar name to it. Um, many of the butterscotch cultivars are doing a play on that butterscotch name. So you might find something that uses butter in the name, for instance. For cantaloupe, orange sherbet, ambrosia, and divergent have all been highly recommended through University of Wisconsin's taste testing panels. And you see that traditional cantaloupe shape in the upper left corner there, but all three are highly recommended. Uh, you may have some issues finding the seeds right now, so look towards that pick a carrot website if you can. The Chalantaise is a French melon, and it's the one that you see here in the four feature. So this is the very smaller melon. It is more French, but it's gonna be a bit more smaller. And you will find it with and without netting. I would think that this one may be a pretty good one if you are going to uh, use prosciutto in recipes. You might decide to utilize this one for it. Some medicinal ones to know. Canary is the one you see in this top yellow corner. So a very different looking melon, more that white flesh to it, um, has more of that yellow feature on the outside to it, but also can be a pretty nice one to grow and can perform really well for you. The Crenshaw is pale abalone, it's cream, creamy yellow feature to it. Uh, the Gallia, which you saw on the first slide, tends to be more of a banana-like aroma with it. The Honeydew, more earlier maturity, sweeter taste, typically more attractive appearance to it. And the Pil de Sapo is a yellow and green molted skin. And that's the one you see in the foreground here too, um, is this, this one. So you are gonna find quite a large range of these musk melon types. Know that if you were to purchase cantaloupe seeds and giving that name of cantaloupe, you should expect it to have kind of that traditional cantaloupe coloration and feature. But if you're looking towards some of these other ones, know that they may be a little bit different when it comes to their taste, when it comes to how they perform in the backyard growing area, and also when it just comes to their coloration. I'll talk more about the harvest of melons later on today, because especially for the musk melon family, there can be some issues, as I think a lot of us are aware of. In this pumpkin gourd category, you're gonna find a large range in here too. Lots of cooking, display, as well as both, both of them. Most of them tend to be about 100 to 100 in days maturity. You will find smaller pumpkins that will yield earlier than that. I think for us in Northern Illinois, this is fine because in most cases, when we're planting, say, the end of May, we're typically going to be harvesting this group um, towards the middle of September. So I think you will find that as far as just the growth and overall growth of it can work pretty well for you when it comes to it. Um, they have various sizes, shapes, and colors. When you start looking through your seed catalog, you can sometimes be very overwhelmed with this category. Um, there's lots of different cat subcategories in here, something like a jack-o'-lanterns, giant pumpkins, white pumpkins. You see a lot of pie pumpkins in which these would be sometimes smaller and allow you to really cook with it. You'll also find unique color and shape. And as I share with you, some of these can be both a display pumpkin as well as a cooking pumpkin. You can get some benefits from them when it comes to this group. So some cultivars to recommend. You know, I've shared with you about the Jaradel, which I love, the blue pumpkin. Long Island cheese, as well as a Cinderella pumpkin, are two um, display pumpkins and yet can grow and be eaten really well. Uh, can I find double use from both of them. The small orange, a two to five pound one, is baby bear, small sugar, sugar treat. Most of these are going to be ones that you would just be using as display pumpkins. Although if there is any mention of a sugar in there, know that that would be also one that you could cook with. 
the standard orange would be one that you probably expect to not be cooking with. It's not going to have a flesh inside that would really merit cooking down or give you as much of that cooking pumpkin that you might want. These are going to be a little bit better for uh, actually display pumpkins. You know, bushkin is listed here, and this would also be a bush pumpkin, and it would also be a standard orange of 8 to 15 pounds in yield. This might be a pretty good option, having that bush quality of the pumpkin as well as that 8 to 15 pounds. Large orange tends to be about 15 to 25 pounds, such as Happy Jack or Big Tom. You'll find a large grouping and many different ones out there when it comes to kind of this category. In this photo here, this is Jack B. Little. So it's a very small pumpkin. And as the name denotes, it's, it will, it's not gonna get that big. It's gonna be a very smaller one. As I've taught more master gardener classes, I have been very impressed with the number of uh, volunteers and participants who are actually growing the Atlantic Giant. I have taught two classes in two different parts of Illinois in the last year. And when we talk about pumpkins, many of them have shared that they have grown the Atlantic Giant. And it's the one that you see here. And this is very small in its infancy. Many folks are uh, taking it up as a challenge and growing them in the backyard. And these are pumpkins that are getting 900 to 1,000 pounds. You have to baby this pumpkin, as you can imagine. Uh, and it is one where there's a lot of information out there when it comes to best practices and, and how to get this pumpkin uh, where it needs to be. So certainly it could be one that, you know, if you're looking for a garden challenge, you might look towards this one. Uh, if you want to be on the front page of the newspaper, you might also grow this one. And it can grow well, just know that it is going to need some babying uh, throughout the growing season. For this large group of pumpkins, we see 95 to 120 days. The fruit can vary per plant. Sometimes this is one to five. It's all really dependent on that type. If you were to grow Jack B. Little pumpkins, they're very tiny, very small. And you may find that they cover the plants and you just need one of them compared to some of the other ones out there. Fruits will uh, six to 12 feet between rows in row about 18 to 72 inches. What about gourd or pumpkin? What makes a gourd? What makes a pumpkin? A gourd is typically a winter squash. We'll recognize they both are winter squash. A pumpkin is a winter squash, but a pumpkin really has no botanical meaning. In the United States, we've just given it this name of pumpkin to usually denote it has an orange characteristic to it, and it may be used for carving, versus a gourd that is a winter squash like pumpkin, but it's usually for ornamental, it's for utensils, it's for general use. I've listed a number of gourds here that are highly recommended that will all need to be some drying out mechanism with them. You will also find seed packets that list gourd mixtures. And so by planting these, you will get a wide range of different gourd shapes and different colors and textures that you could utilize and grow. Uh, the loofah, as you can imagine, is one where you could be growing your own loofah sponge. There is some guidance out there as far as getting it to dry completely on the vine in that growing area. There are a number of also different characteristics you'll sometimes see in the pumpkin gourd categories with these warts. And I use the term warts to discuss what you see here in this photo. Sometimes it's been genetically bred that way. They have crossed it so that this pumpkin or gourd has all of these warts and different colors to them. It could also be environmental, and sometimes we can also see it as more insect damage that's causing it. Environmentally, usually there may be a water issue where so much water has caused an issue and created this warts appearance. So in my summer squash category, I'll spend a little bit of time on this group, but I think a lot of us are very familiar with how it grows and, and the yields of it. And this includes things like zucchini, yellow crookneck, patty pan, as well as round. Typically, you're thinking 18 to 24 inches apart. In your rows, about six feet apart. You could probably go a little bit tighter, I think, depending on your plant and the size of it. They tend to have some issues early on, and you will usually find a bush vining types. Those would be the ones to look towards when it comes to your spacing. 
you see in this photo provided by Kay, uh, who's one of our master gardener volunteers. Um, so you see that the, the squash is just starting to develop here, which is what you're really after. So if I was going to remove zucchini blossoms to stuff, I would actually want to wait till after I actually have uh, pollination occurring on my plants. That's really crucial for your zucchini plant. So kind of three categories here, your yellow, your zucchini, your patty pan. Patty pan will also go by scallop and you will see that term scallop used pretty frequently when it comes to the patty pan. You'll also see just different shapes. Sometimes you will occasionally will have more of a globe kind of characteristic towards the bottom left photo that you see here for some of your zucchini plants as well. Uh, it's just gonna depend uh, a lot on that. I know in some of my home and garden areas and centers, I've seen aristocrat for zucchini, Sundance, gold bar is very rec highly recommended. Um, Peter Pan and Sunburst are also two very good ones, as well as some additional ones that you see listed here. My winter squash group tends to be good for baking, pies, roasting, and other features. Yes, they could be great display, but in most cases we're thinking we're gonna cook with them. And you will find a wide range of different shapes, of colors, textures, and sweetness. You will also find that many of them can be very prolific producers, especially that butter squash plant. Tends to overdo it sometimes, I find, when I grow butter, not squash. This group includes things such as acorn, buttercup, butternut, the delicata dumpling type squash, the blue hubbard or the hubbard squash, kabocha, which is a Japanese type of pumpkin, as well as that spaghetti squash. Uh, the kabocha and the delicata has edible skin. Most of the others, you will actually be removing that outside skin, but for the delicata and the kabocha, you're actually going to be potentially eating that skin if you so chose. I shared with you in a previous webinar the honey nut squash, which you see here. And so this was one where I am going to try to grow it this season. I picked it up from a farmer's market vendor I knew. And you can see I've got kind of a 12 inch ruler down here at the bottom. And it's a very tiny butternut squash. It's only getting about four inches in, in its, um, in its uh, height. Um, so it is more of an individual personal squash. It tasted good. Uh, <laughs> I liked it. Um, and I think it's a pretty prolific producer too. So I've listed a number of different cultivars out there, uh, some that are recommended. This is very limiting. Just know that there's a lot more that I could really provide for you. There's a lot of butternut squash out there, and you see some such as the Waltham, very traditional butternut squash. This still performs really well for you. The Brulee is a small butternut squash, as is a butter baby and a butter bush. Um, one to mention, or one of the ones that people are really looking more towards, is the spaghetti squash. Orangetti is highly recommended, as is Tavoli and a squash sugaretti, something that has a bit more of a sugarish compound to it. In the last couple of years, I've had a number of questions at our extension office about the candy and pink banana roaster squash. And these are very sweet squash. And you see a photo of this pink banana here. Um, folks have tried and grow, grown it and really kind of like its kind of quality to it but it is a, a prolific producer. I've known folks to roast it. I've also known folks to grow it and make it into breads and pies and been very pleased with the flavor of it. As of this morning, I ordered two of them, the candy and the pink banana. So we'll be growing it this summer to see how it performs um, and can keep you posted if you will. With the winter squash, we're looking at about 85 to 100 day maturity. So some will be a little bit earlier. Uh, most will be about four to eight squash per plant. Although I think the butternut squash, as some of us have known, is very prolific and could be much more prolific. For a lot of the bush type, you will find that you could do 18 inches down a row versus a larger variety that may spread out quite more. You're gonna be a little bit more limited when it comes to it. There's a wide range of storage ability and harvest. 
they may need to curing and really look at that vine length as well. Watermelon will be both a seedless and seeded varieties. If you are purchasing a seedless variety of watermelon, you will always have in that packet a variety of watermelon that can help your watermelon pollinate. So while it is seedless, it still needs a, an additional variety to help with the pollination. And the seed companies are including that in your packet. Think about the spacing of, or rather the size of your melon. Some of these can get 35 to 40 pounds. That's a very big watermelon. It's waiting a long time to get them to yield for you as well. We see about six feet in rows. We see about seven to 10 between rows is a pretty good strategy here. Uh, the orange glow watermelon is the one you see higher up in this photo. That's a very good yielding one. I've included a number of maturity dates for these cultivars here, such as Crimson Sweet, Charleston Gray, Moon and Stars, all of which come highly recommended through some of our um, research as well as from other individuals. One of the main questions that we, we get when it comes to grown watermelon is that it can be a challenge. And I think that this is a plant that really will benefit from having good drainage, especially if you have an area in your garden which has sandy soil and can provide some drainage. I think that can be very crucial. I would also look to hill up watermelon if you can to help with it. The other challenge we run into is harvest and maturity date is really crucial here. Knowing when it will be mature is what you're after. When it comes to harvest, this could be of that yellow underside, kind of underbelly, that is usually kind of a cream color. You will also see a brown dried tendril, and I have circled this in the red as to what that looks like. As the watermelon is growing, it is typically very green, and it looks like a pigtail. And yet, as you get closer to actually harvesting your watermelon, you will find that this will be brown and it will dry up. You also should have a shiny or a dull color when it comes to watermelon, and it should also maybe even have a little bit insect damage to tell you that it's starting to ripen up. But I would say that your main thing is going to be maturity date. That's really what you're going to look towards when it comes to them. Uh, I've grown watermelon some years and had good success, and some years I've had very poor success. A lot of it, I think, has to do with some of the rain water that we're getting in June. Uh, some physical issues, know that your plants can get blossom and rot, which you see a photo of right here. You know, like tomatoes, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's just something where over time it should work itself out. You may find you have many blossoms and no fruit. Yet again, typically the male flowers are the first to appear and the first to open up, and then the female flowers follow up with that. But you could be having some issues with that. Just know that you may have an imbalance here. And what you may have to do is actually um, start your plant a little bit later, plant it later, because it could be that our June or that end of May is still a little bit too cold and it's just not developing as fast as it needs to. You sometimes may have misshapen fruit. It could look weird or something, and that usually is tied to poor pollination. It could be that you don't have enough male female flowers on that squash plant. You may also have that you're just not getting that pollination you need in which potentially planting buckwheat might have helped to attract some of those pollinators. Wilting symptoms can be noticeable, both from too much heat as well as too much water, insect damage, and disease. So those wilting symptoms could be a combination of many different factors that go into it. And just kind of keep that in mind, that when it comes to that issue or diagnosing it, there are certainly things that you could see but there may be more environmental stuff going on. For this last part, diseases and insect management, um, I've listed a number of these things that to look towards when it comes to actually growing your squash that could help with this. Floating row cover, I've mentioned quite a bit today, and that would be something where it's that sheer fabric that allows for water and sunlight penetration, and yet keeps some of those insects from being a problem. You might also look towards mulching if that situation works for you. Always try to water in the morning as this allows for the leaves to really dry out and keep disease from spreading in that garden. I do a lot of egg cluster scouting, which you see in this photo is a cluster of squash bug eggs. I could destroy these and hopefully that might help a bit with 
uh, controlling the insects. Because uh, they tend to hide, removing any debris that gets in the way or around the plant could be very helpful when it comes to keeping them from, from reproducing uh, much faster. Also look towards disease resistance. And then I would also include yellow sticky traps here. Because they are highly attracted to the yellow orange flowers of the squash family, if you have the ability to put these out, that may help you out quite a bit when it comes to controlling them. I've also known other folks to take sheet pans or rather um, paper, uh, paper plates uh, that are yellow and utilize a sticky adhesive on them. And that has been used to help address in the insect issues. There are also pesticides, both for uh, fungal control as well as insect control. Although we tend to see it more with insect control than we really do with fungal and diseases. So I'll show you a couple of these as we kind of start uh, working more. This is squash vine borer, a very common insect that we see, especially on zucchini plant. They do not tend to harm butternut squash, cucumbers, or melons, but they really go towards the zucchini and squash. And you can see what this severe damage can look like. Just the plant has wilted, it's drilled, it's laid its holes into the squash plant itself. If this keeps happening to you, you may look to actually push back your planting to about early July. This is typically when the, the adult is not flying in our area, so a later planting could help out quite a bit. You could also put a yellow pan or pail and fill it with water as they will tend to go towards it and drown into it. That could be an option that works for you. Also look towards row cover. Um, that would be another strategy. Of course, you wanna make sure that this is applied before your pollinators are active, as they're not gonna be able to actually pollinate your squash as it's developing. You can see the adult here on the left. So you're probably not going to see the adult. What you're really going to see though is kind of the juvenile. So the juvenile, the nymph, the eggs will be laid in the stem as it's bored in. And then if you were to then take a knife and serrate the rest of that stalk, you may find it's just full of the juvenile squash vine borers just going through and being very active on this plant stem. The squash bug is another one, and this is one that loves to hide. They'll have lots of different uh, nymphs and adults. So you see the smaller nymphs in this photo here. Uh, just a mixture of them will just be all over your plants. You will find them hiding in the leaves. You will find them hiding under any kind of debris in your growing area. And they're a major nuisance when it comes to the actual fruit uh, of squash as it's growing. You could help this by doing some trellising to get it off the ground and help keep, their, uh, keep them from being protected. You might also look towards row covers before bloom. And then you could look towards that sticky traps with the yellow or even the blue Hubbard squash cords could be helpful to, to really trap them. If you are using any black plastic, know that they will also hide under there as well. And look towards any egg masses on the other sides of the leaves too. Our final main insect is gonna be cucumber beetles. And these are both spotted and striped. One of the main challenges with them is that while they are very prolific and they fly, they also can spread bacterial wilt. So within their mouth, as they are chewing on different parts of your squash plant, they could be potentially spreading that disease. They do love that yellow orange flower that a lot of our squash family members have, and you will find sometimes they're hiding in the nooks and crannies of those flowers. And if you found the ability to do some sticky traps, that might work pretty well for you because it could really be attracting them and keeping them from being much of a problem. You will see their, their eggs, but I don't find it's easy to necessarily remove them by hand compared to squash bugs. They also really like the blue hovered squash, so that could be your trap crop. You may also find a benefit of removing a very heavily infested blossom. If you see a blossom such as the photo in here, that might be the route that you go because there's just so much, you could just destroy them and remove it. And maybe that may help you for a bit of time. 
For the, ends, for the diseases, know that it's a lot of fungal airborne. So it is those diseases that are very hard to control because they're moving in via the wind. And what you see with something like fusarium wilt, uh, lots of wilting symptoms early on, but you would see yellowing or browning. The difference between fusarium wilt and say um, insect damage would be that you would see that damage at the base of the plant where there's that kind of sawdust frass that has been cut into it. You do want to consider maintaining moisture during this time for fusarium wilt, crop or tail, the family if necessary. I would still suggest that if you had such severe case at this point of fusarium in this photo, I would go ahead and remove it from the field. It's really not serving you much good at this point. It's not really liable to really bounce back because of just as severe damage as it has really gotten in this situation. Uh, bacterial wilt looks a little bit similar to fusarium wilt. Just know that you know lots of cucumber beetles could be spreading this. Uh, there's also this noticeable bacterial ooze. I did not have a photo with me, but I but there is a number of bacterial ooze photos of what this looks like. It does not tend to overwinter in previous debris, and I think that's very important here is that while you would still be crop rotating, it does not tend to overwinter in the soil. One option is actually to bury the plants to prevent further spread of this at, during the growing season. What we also find is that managing the cucumber beetles is your best option at this point. Powdery and downy mildew both kind of go hand in hand. When we, when we talk about these mildews, we tend to see them more often in Northern Illinois towards mid-August, end of August. However, every season is a little bit different and you may be getting hit hard with these much earlier than parts of Northern Illinois tend to get hit with. What we do see is both of them are based on temperature and based on environment. So powdery is gonna be in more warm, drier climates with 90% humidity versus downy mildew, it's gonna be in more cool, humid conditions. Uh, the powdery mildew use is what you see here in this photo versus downy mildew is a bit more yellow, has a bit more of a brown coloration to it. A lot of times prevention, removing debris from fields, especially with powdery mildew, having good airflow and air circulation is what you're after, which is why I keep sharing more and more that think about, consider what that spacing is because you wanna make sure that there's good airflow to keep this from being much of a problem. You might also consider planting tolerant varieties that can be able to have some sort of disease resistance in this situation. But as I share with you, it depends on when this hits. You may find that if this is coming in say mid-August and your pumpkin or gourd crop is almost ready to be harvested, you may find that you may just from a homeowner backyard perspective, remove a couple of leaves and be able to address it. Compare that to if this was hitting say mid-June or first week of July and you're just in the middle of the growing season for the squash family. The backyard perspective may be to actually look at some fungicide treatments. The harvesting of this family comes with its own intricacies. That is one, sometimes one of the most common questions that I get at the extension office is, you know, when should I harvest this plant? And I share with you that it is very cultivar specific. It's very hard for me to generalize and say that all watermelons should be harvested on this date. It's really going to be based on the size, the color, the weight, and just lots of those other physical features that you have to consider when it comes to them. You will find most seed packets and transplant information will include something about the weight or the expected weight of that squash. That can be a great guidance when it comes to determining when to harvest and when to pick. Look towards days since bloom. There's a number of seed packets that will say, you know, you plant this uh, spaghetti squash, for instance, and 45, 50 days till bloom, you should expect to then harvest from it. So bring out the calendar, look towards that. I know a number of growers and backyard growers that will take a Sharpie and as something is maturing, they may actually write the harvest date on the outside of that shell 
so that they are at least kind of playing around with it. Yet again, every season can be different. And certainly the wetness that we are seeing in the early part of our season can play a role within getting to harvest date. And so you may find that this is later or maybe earlier. Your summer squash is typically gonna be harvested two to three times a week. I think that's what you're gonna find in most cases, having to cut or a gently twist off the fruits. The melons, the pumpkins, gourds, and other winter squash can be a little bit of a different story. Melons will depend highly on that cultivar. There are going to be some where you could, that will say that at this maturity date, you should cut and leave the stem. So cut the stem off, leave the rest of the vine, or it may be a melon where you could just slightly tug it and then it will come off the vine. It could be also a changes to a strong yellow or a aroma. You might smell the melon and find an aroma that you weren't necessarily expecting or rather you were expecting, like a banana aroma or a traditional kind of cantaloupe kind of smell to it, that strong melon smell. You may also find that it has that pronounced kind of brownish kind of webbing to it. But know your melon. That sounds so silly, and yet there are so many different cultivars out there, some that will be cut from the vine, some that will slip, some that will not stay that true brown kind of cantaloupe-ish type color that we expect. Especially if you're going to grow some new ones this year, <laughs> know your melon. That's, that's the easiest thing I can tell you. For the pumpkins, the gourds, and this winter squash, so that winter squash category, yet again, it's gonna vary. Um, the fruit color should be fully developed. You should see that for your winter squash group. You also wanna consider clipping the handles close to the vine, so that actual stem should be clipped close to the vine. You tend to be able to actually store it a little bit better if you have a little bit more of a stem to it. It should last a little bit longer with that. There's a lot of guides out there that will also mention curing them outdoors. And the process here would be that when you expect to harvest it, you would come through, you would cut where the stem meets the vine, and you would leave these out for say five to seven days and allow for them to cure a little bit more, maybe concentrate their sugars, and also kind of, you know, get more of that harder outer shell. You see in this photo is spaghetti squash. This is what we tend to expect when it comes to that full coloration of spaghetti squash. I wanted to include a section on storing the winter squash because I think this is something that we are probably gonna to plan to do. And this is a photo taken from uh, my area, gosh, probably about four or five years ago. I had a very prolific uh, butternut squash yield. And yet again, I recognize there are some things that could have been a little bit different when it comes to actually harvesting these and utilizing them. When it comes to storing this family, know that temperature and humidity are gonna be crucial. I've tried to list these based on the number of months you might expect to be able to store them, and also include what those indoor um, air temperatures need to be in order to secure that monthly storage ability. You'll see things like a butternut squash where two to three months at 50 to 50 degree Fahrenheit, and about 50 to 75% humidity would be fine for turban and buttercup as well of, of storing these. You'll also note that the blue Hubbard squash as well as the roaster I mentioned today could store around for five to six months if the temperature is right and if the humidity is right too, the relative humidity indoors. So it can depend highly on both of those being, being the main pieces here. I am beginning to wrap up today. I know we've got a number of questions in the chat box, so please feel free to go ahead and put some additional ones in there. Uh, a lot of our webinars are starting to wrap up, but we are still doing a lot of blogs. Uh, the Good Growing blog with Chris Enroth, Ken Johnson, and Katie Parker is still very active every week. I pulled from their blog post this week that they are focusing on how to grow sweet potatoes, which is a good question we get a lot of questions about. Uh, as a sneak peek, typically we grow sweet potatoes the first week of June in Northern Illinois. However, more information can be found on this week's Good Growing blog. Flowers, Fruits, and Frass is also another blog that Kelly Alsop in Central Illinois focuses in on. 
as well as my own um, with as raise, grow, harvest, eat, repeat. We're trying to be a little bit more active in that different topics. We still have a number of webinars that are, that are occurring, the Growing a Horticulture in Northwest Illinois with Bruce Black, as well as some guests, is still happening. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be moving into growing uh, berries and small fruits. The Four Season Garden webinar series is also very active right now. This is on Tuesdays. They started this week and they're going to May 26. Uh, with this. And as always, these webinars are free. So you just have to find the links for them, um, and register for them, and go from them. And we try to make these available for you on YouTube uh, as well. I will be working on a couple of webinar series towards the end of May. We are still hiding out more details on them. So uh, there is my phone number and my email address if you have any questions uh, about today or anything kind of related to growing fruits and vegetables. You can also find today's evaluation survey at that uh, area there underneath the question box, uh, the QR code. I will also send out an email today with a link to the evaluation survey. This is very helpful when it comes to determining what we're going to be covering in the next couple of weeks in the next webinar. So if you have suggestions, this would be a great place in the evaluation to share them. Know that the evaluation is anonymous. I know that some people have asked for information in the questions. Uh, when they have filled it out, and yet I cannot see them. So know that you may have to reach out to me again uh, because I, it's all anonymous. Um, we have a very active Facebook page right now today and the last couple of days and continue to do such. And um, yeah, with that, I will get into some questions then. All right, question from AJ. So last year, some things happened to decimate my squash plants. This includes zucchini, yellow zucchini, spaghetti squash, acorn squash, uh, kukazua, uh, an Italian long squash cucumbers. The only thing that I found was a green type ladybug after almost all the plants had bied back and disappeared. Is there anything I can do to avoid a repeat of last year's failure? To me, AJ, I think this is probably your cucumber beetles. Uh, that you saw. I would look to, if you have the ability to provide some row cover for those first couple of weeks, I would also probably look toward blue planting blue hover squash as a sacrifice. And you would probably put this at the rows of, at the start of the row of all of your, your planting areas to act as that sacrifice. I would also look towards having some yellow or orange sticky traps to help out quite a bit with it. So I would try to throw everything at this cucumber beetle. Um, we see it pretty often every year, and it is something that is very hard to control, especially because it's a flying insect. So I would try to do about everything you could as far as a cultural practice to really control them uh, in that situation. Next question, question on how to de deal with rabbits raccoons, possums, deers, and etc. It is very important to grow squash where wildlife cannot access them. Yeah, I, Deborah, this is a good question and it's really hard to manage these because many of them, especially some of what you're talking about, does need some, core, some apparatus around it to keep them from getting to it. And this could be that you have some kind of of chicken wire or, or something that could keep them from being around it. I know when we grow fruit trees, we will also put some um, you know, soap around the necks of our plants. And this might be something that might help address some of the deer population. I know that sometimes higher up, when a plant is growing much higher up, sometimes that can help when it comes to those smaller mammals such as rabbits. And, um, and squirrels if it's kind of higher up, higher off the ground, but it can be a bit, of a, a bit of a challenge. I think probably our next webinar series is going to get into wildlife management in the backyard. So I will hopefully have more information for you with some better strategies in the next couple of weeks. Question, I get winter squash to grow with huge leaves and blossoms, but then they will wilt, all wilt and die within the weeks. If you were growing these and you found that it was not a squash vine borer, which I don't think it is, um, 
You know, you may have some issues with, uh, it could be environmentally based, but I think it could also be more some kind of disease issue that might be going on. You know, especially if you're seeing lots of wilting symptoms happen. Another thing is that depending on when you're growing this, we saw a lot of wilt symptoms in June due to the frequency of rain, is that we just had so much rain during June that that tended to overload the plant. So it could be either option. It could be environmental. It could also be that you have some disease problem happening here. You've seen some of the slides today that I, I hope maybe could help you address which one it might be. I'm more inclined to think it's environmental, and this might be where you just try to maybe provide some mulch around the winter squash to kind of guide it through that wet period that we might be encountering uh, this upcoming season. You might even try to hill it up a little bit to provide better drainage with it as well. Uh, question mentioned, uh, thanks. So Lisa mentioned pumpkin maturity dates. Yes, I agree. It's a, something we don't think a lot about um, is that maturity date. And I think it's really important because it can take some time. All right, question. You mentioned that sugar bay is a good producer. In your experiment experience, approximately how many fruits were produced on one plant or vine? I found four fruits on sugar baby. Um, we harvested from all of them um, and it yielded pretty well for me. And because of the sugar baby quality being a little bit more of a bush kind of shape to it, I was able to space them out a little bit differently compared to some of those very long vines that we sometimes see with Crimson Sweet or some of those other, other ones. So by having smaller spacing with the sugar baby, it allowed me to grow more as well as to have a bit more of a confined spacing. Yet again, I felt like there were a lot of seeds in it. So that was why I'm probably not gonna grow it again. Question, um, do you plant sacrificial plants in the garden amongst the rest of the plants or off to the side nearby? What I have seen as far as the Blue Hubbard being that sacrifice is to actually start Blue Hubbard at the start of your row and at the end of your row. So almost creating a perimeter, if you will. You will also find a lot of other crops out there that would be considered sacrificial crops too, um, that insects tend to like them much more than the others. And most of them, the two strategies is that you have to kind of create a perimeter around your growing area, which could be at the start of the rows, or you, and you also have to start them at least one or two weeks earlier so that they're starting to produce faster than the main crops that you're wanting to grow. Question, how did you mount the hog panels? In this situation, the hog panels were mounted with um, some very heavy metal stakes. So the metal stakes were first driven to the ground and then we tied them with some additional um, metal, uh, metal apparatuses to kind of loop into those hog panels. So if you think about, you know, like I shared with you last week of tomato staking where you're kind of going down two rows and you're putting out these metal stakes. That was what we first did on those rows. And then from there, we had on one side the hog panel and then bent it over. It was not as perfect as I'd like it to be, and we still had to push it, push it down into it, but I did find it, it worked well for that situation. Every question, everywhere I plant my zucchini, I get squash bore. Is there anything I can do about it? It's unfortunate with the squash vine borer because it is a flying insect. I think in your case, Marsha, because it just keeps hitting you every season, it may be to have some kind of uh, floating row cover or some kind of covering in place for those first couple of weeks before it starts to flower. At least so maybe it could kind of uh, adjust and get some good growth. I have also found that even though it had some squash vine borer damage, the squash plant did um, survive a little bit and it did still produce a little bit for me. But yet again, because it's that flying insect, it can be very hard to control it uh, and can do it other than provide maybe some kind of protection. I have seen some suggestions, purely anecdotal, that people will kind of provide a barrier between the stem of that plant, of the squash plant, and the soil. And so 
from there you might decide to do some kind of mulching system around the base as it starts to get going because it's really going after that stem but because of that flying quality crop rotation is not going to help and moving it around isn't it's really going to be based on trying to create a barrier to keep it from getting to it question will all bush type cukes have a bush in name Stacy, they tend to. I, I think you still may have some cucumbers that have some kind of uh, bush quality to them, but most of them are gonna have that bush name in them. And that should be a very good giveaway that, okay, this is my bush type, it should work great for me. Question, can an already existing tree in a yard be used as a makeshift trellis? I would think that you could do this, Deborah, especially if you had some support uh, above. You see sometimes with the trellising systems for cucumbers where they have strings kind of coming down from the top of their trellis system. And you may be able to do that with an existing tree. Uh, I, one of our growers in Winnebago County, he lets his vines grow all over his trees. Um, and, and it's a trellis system and he has pumpkins in his trees, which he likes to share and talk about. So you may find that that support system is already there to use. And, it would just be some difficulty perhaps in harvesting and getting to them. Question, if I plant different types of pumpkins in my pumpkin hill, will they cross pollinate and not end up being the pumpkins I wanted? I'm planting pied pumpkin and jaradel in my hill. So Lisa, what you're gonna see is that they may be, they may cross, but that's not gonna be noticeable in the fruit this season. It would be in next year's where you may have a difference. So if you were growing pied pumpkin and jaradel this year, they may cross this season if they were open pollinated. And then if you save the seeds for one or two of those from this year, you may see a difference next year. It's very hard sometimes to know about the genetics and what things will show up and look like, but just know that that's not gonna be noticeable in this season. And if there were any noticeable differences in these this season in growing them, it could be something genetically based, just something was off in how they were growing but they're not gonna cross and result in something different this season. Question, are seeds from previous pumpkin harvests viable if they've been properly dried and stored? What about the seeds from Cinderella pumpkin is still intact today? You would find that these would still be viable. Most of them can stay around for at least a couple of years, especially if you have dried them, if you've stored them correctly. Usually the main um, culprit for any type of unviability, if you will, tends to be if they've been stored in the refrigerator or in very moist conditions. You could still do a simple uh, seed germination test where if you had a lot of them, you could put them in a rolled up wet uh, uh, piece of paper or rather um, a paper towel and then let them see if they can germinate on a roll and see if they can germinate after a while. And that could be help you figure it out with it. But in most cases, they should be fine as long as they were, they were, they were uh, stored properly. The same with your Cinderella pumpkin could be fine. Question, do the yellow sticky traps attract more bugs than just your plant? Would it be similar to Japanese beetles attracting so many to your garden? They tend to be very good about just going for cucumber beetles and squash bugs, the yellow sticky traps. They will, of course, attract others, but because these insect pests are so heavily targeting towards the yellow and the orange coloration, they tend to go more towards them than others. They're not gonna be the same situation as the Japanese beetle trap, where it's the pheromones that are attracting them and they're causing major havoc. They're gonna be fine. Question, uh, last year, my cucumber, several varieties produced gold-colored fruit rather than the normal green color. Yet other cucumbers and squash in the same bed produced your spine. Any suggestion? Is my soil deficient in a particular nutrient? You may have some particular nutrient that might be a little bit off. It could be some pollination issues that might be occurring there too. And sometimes it's just a genetic reaction of some of these plants. I think especially as we look towards June and July, where it maybe isn't always as warm as it needs to be, that may set them back when it comes to their ripening, to their coloration. 
Certainly it could be a nutrient deficiency, but typically it was, if it was some sort of nutrient deficiency, you would see greening of leaves. You would also see it potentially in other, other cultivars nearby. You know, I think in this situation, it could be more environmental, which in turn might be impacting it based on the genetics um, with that. And as always, you know, as I'm answering a lot of y'all's questions, feel free to email me if you have questions from the previous year with photos. I'm more than happy to kind of talk through some of these scenarios too. Question, my yellow squash last year only produced male flowers. Can anything be done to stop this from happening this year? In most cases, that was more of an environmental issue that was happening for you. So I would hope that June might be a little bit different for us this year as your yellow squash develops. It's very hard to, be able to do an action to keep that from happening. You might be able to start your plants maybe a week earlier in the soil. Maybe that might be what they need to hopefully address just all of the male flowers and none of the female flowers. You might also even think about planting it just to, you know, towards the end of June into July. But because it's an environmentally based issue, I think it's gonna be very hard to, um, to necessarily keep it from happening, other than your planting time that I think is gonna be crucial. Uh, planting cantaloupe near cucumbers have resulted in a cantaloupe taste in cucumber. What is the recommended distance between these two plants? So typically, I think you're gonna do six to eight. You know, it's kind of odd, AJ, that you're seeing that, is usually we don't have that. You could also have some water issues happening here too, and you might try to make sure that you're having good proper drainage because sometimes that cantaloupe can, um, can be taking up too much water uh, after a couple of, of weeks. And so it may be messing with its flavor. It could be crossing, uh, but typically we don't see that too much. I think in your situation, um, I would go by the guidance of six to eight feet uh, between them. And if you look towards your growing area, you might also try to either um, get your cucumbers on the far end of the garden if you could, and you may even time it. I wonder if you could maybe time your cucumbers to flower a little bit earlier than your cantaloupe are. It could maybe help address that. Um, I think it is a little more environmental, uh, but yet again, the guidance isn't always there as it should be when it comes to spacing to potentially keep some of these issues from occurring. Um, yet again, I think there's probably a combination of other factors that are going in there too. Uh, but maybe towards the far end is where the cucumbers go. And then also try to maybe grow them a little bit earlier than, 